The term Ultramontanism defines a political stance of Catholicism. Its followers take their orders exclusively from the Vatican or Papal Court. According to rumours, a secret and very radical splinter group exists, which is entirely subjected to the Holy See. Their task is to fight against any modern and anti-papal vein in society by all means. It's said they have requisitioned diverse artifacts and relics for the church. There they are again, the men with the pointed hats. Our lifesavers. Google men, they're called, aren't they? Yes, indeed. Here, Google men fight against ultramontanists. We really have got ourselves into deep trouble. Slowly, this story is becoming interesting. This is going to be a really hot scoop. We should present these pictures to Inspector Fisher. The modern Google Man were probably formed in 1998 on the occasion of the 113th anniversary of the death of King Ludwig II. They are rooted in the tradition of the Coalition, a secret society that was founded by Ludwig II. They believe in the murder of the king by the former Prussian Secret Service and defend the honor of the dead king, also in other areas. They wear black frocks and pointed hats, the Google. Mr. Fisher, we're coming along with our work and are going to report back to you soon. We need to know if there's a match between the enclosed prints and either those of Franchetti's or Beatrix. Thanks. Kind regards, Sarah Hamilton. talking about? Googleman? Ultramont? Who? Are you going crazy? I need facts, not conspiracy theories. But if you think about it, it all makes sense. The Googleman have come to prevent the Ultramonists from... Enough, enough, stop it. My head is spinning. I don't want to hear one more word about secret societies. Now I'm going to give Franchetti a rough time. He'll be in for a nasty shock. Now, we really have convinced him. I believe the inspector's horizon is, to say the least, a bit limited, to be quite honest. We should inform Beatrix. She's probably concerned. No way, Professor. Haven't you noticed? It's not raining anymore. There's work waiting for us underneath the mountain. Your lovebird will have to wait.
Hello, Miss Hamilton. The person mentioned above withdrew from the interrogation and has been missing ever since. The person in question is not unknown to the database of Interpol and has already been involved in several crimes with a sacred or historical background. Should you meet him again, don't give yourself away and call the police immediately. Franchetti is said to be... The Royal Bavarian fisherman, Jacob Liddell, was the only witness who could have seen the king's death. Apparently, his silence was bought with a lot of money. This is a possible explanation for him becoming a rich man after the king's death. He stuck to his vow of silence, but wrote a booklet containing the truth about the events that was supposed to be buried with him. Even today, there are different opinions of whether the booklet did go to the grave with Liddell or that it is kept somewhere else. Look, a picture of Ludwig. I wonder whose arm is around him. We are going to find out, Professor. Ludwig used to be a passionate photographer, but all his photos have disappeared. If we find them, we will be world famous! The Royal Bavarian fisherman, Jacob Liddell, was the only witness who could have seen the king's death. Apparently, his silence was bought with a lot of money. This is a possible explanation for him becoming a rich man after the king's death. He stuck to his vow of silence, but wrote a booklet containing the truth about the events that was supposed to be buried with him. Even today, there are different opinions of whether the booklet did go to the grave with Liddell or that it is kept somewhere else. In 1868, the Vienna court was informed that photography had become the king's passion. In Hohenschwangau and on Castleburg, the king had installed a well-equipped photo laboratory and darkroom. Each present from the king also contained a signed photo of him so that it can be claimed that King Ludwig II invented the autograph card. Unfortunately, many of the photographs disappeared after his death. Fifth of June, 1868. Fifth December, 1885. There are few days when we regret having taken the picture with our special friend. It could have been a fatal error with serious consequences. 
We can't bring ourselves to destroy this piece of evidence, the mirror of the most up-to-date technology. That's why we need a secure place where we can hide the photo, and where no one but my closest allies will get to see it. of June, 7th of July, 1868. Our secretly instructed workers have excavated an entrance within the ruins. We could hardly believe what we discovered. We need to hide our discovery from envious people, therefore we issued the instruction to conceal the entrance in the groundwork of another castle. We are going to commence construction next year. Impossible. This room really isn't a surprise. It's common knowledge that Ludwig had a passion for the theatre. It seems to me the king was a man with many passions. Ludwig II loved theatre and enjoyed being surrounded by actors and authors. But since he deeply disliked the other spectators and gawkers, he started hiring the entire hall so as to enjoy the plays all by himself. In Munich alone, 44 operas, 154 plays, and 11 ballet performances were staged just for the king. Eighth of June, 1868. One of our historians could tell us that the symbols probably originate from the Templars. Templars here in this region? According to this historian, the Templars were completely dispersed by the Inquisition. We certainly need to follow up on this. Now I understand what this is really all about. Already? This is about nothing other than the Grail. I've been convinced of that since the Ultramountainists showed up. Do you believe that the Grail is really down here? I'm a journalist. Belief doesn't help me much. But if the Grail is down here, then I need to find it. Trust me on this.
Already as a 16-year-old, Ludwig II listened to Tannhäuser and called Wagner his God and Redeemer. In 1864, he sent a golden ring with a red ruby to the indebted Wagner in Stuttgart. And on the 4th of May of the same year, the King and Wagner met face to face in a residence in Munich for the first time. This was the start of a long friendship and mutual admiration. It was King Ludwig II who drove Wagner to write and compose Parsifal. The Boonweinstück, as Wagner called it, tells the legend of the Grail Knights and ends with the fortuitous Parsifal becoming the new Grail King and the Grail Knights rendering homage to him. In November 1880, Ludwig II attended a private performance of the orchestra's prelude. Wagner himself wanted his creation to have an enchanting effect on him. Ludwig II identified with the Parsifal from Wagner's work, and Wagner also saw the young king as an innocent grail searcher. Even though Neuschwanstein was a highlight in Ludwig's construction work, he was planning on building an incomparable grail castle on top of the ruins of Falkenstein. This is where the Holy Grail was supposed to find its final resting place if it was ever discovered. Impossible. Not like that. Oh, another dead end. Not like that. Impossible.
Sarah, now everything is clear to me. The king had a double. The king wasn't killed. Yes, that's the riddle's solution. But I also have another assumption. Not only did the king survive, but he also had descendants. Because... Watch out! Behind you! And this is where your adventure ends, you fools. Thanks a lot for your help. And now... Hand me what belongs to the holy chair. And what should that be? Don't pretend to be dumber than you are. Pass me the grail. Prontamente! If you find the grail in here, you can keep it. You work for the Ultramontanists, don't you? I already thought so. The only person I am subordinated to is Cardinal Pietro. No one else! And now, your time has come. Your services are no longer needed. Mille grazie. But I have my instructions. Mi dispiace. No, don't do that. Beatrix, that wasn't one second too early. You're a true guardian angel. How can I thank you? That really was just the right moment. I was sure this Francetti was up to something, and that it wasn't anything good. So I followed him. And, I see now, I wasn't mistaken. He named a certain Cardinal Pietro to be his employer. Well, that is highly remarkable. You've discovered a truly fantastic place down here. Congratulations. Excellent work. But quickly follow me. I need to show you something near the bridge. Dear Miss Hamilton, the results of the analysis of the fingerprints from your previously mentioned counterfeits have arrived. They belong with 99.99% .99 probability to Beatrix von Lohen. I don't know what this means for your research, but I'd like to ask you to immediately get in contact with the police department in Fussen. Best wishes, Fisher, Senior Constable, Police Department, Fussen. Professor, stop! It's a trap! Beatrix! Too late, my dear. Now, I will take what has rightfully belonged to my family for decades. I am the descendant of Lilla von Meiring, to whom Ludwig has promised marriage, and whose reputation he has sullied. But Beatrix, I thought... of the two of us. <laughs> Professor... You ridiculous worm. You never noticed that you were working for me all this time. No one noticed that I'm a von Meiring. All across Bavaria, they fell for my lie. And now, the time has come. Revenge is mine. This witch deceived and tricked me. And now, adieu, you pathetic fool. All of this belongs to me now. Me, alone. We'll see about that. Not like that. In 1867, a romance between Ludwig II and the court actress Lilla von Meiring developed. The opinions about the seriousness of this romance differ, but it's been passed on that von Meiring already saw herself as the Bavarian Pompadour and the next wife of the king. 
When she let intimate details of their relationship leak out to the public, Ludwig reacted angrily and wrote this to his secretary on the 27th of November 1867. The recently so impertinent Meyering shall go to hell. This was the end of the affair as far as the king was concerned, but obviously not to Lilla and her family. Still not cured? Beatrix wanted to kill us. Who's talking about the old hag? I'm talking about the bottle of wine. That was a Chateau Margot from 1899. An invaluable drop. <laughs> I like you better this way, Professor. That's the right attitude. My eternal thanks to you. You have performed a great service for my family. And who are you? I believe Miss Hamilton knows who I am. I assume you are my secret employer. Furthermore, I assume you're a descendant of Ludwig II. The fairy tale king had children? And who else would send me here to hold back the Ultramontanists? You are a very smart person, Miss Hamilton. My expectations of you have been fulfilled. And you are an insistent and stubborn scientist, Professor. My respect. My king. Make sure everything down here is placed in responsible hands. It's in my family's entire heritage. And I have to ask you for one last favor. Please keep my existence a secret. The king didn't have any descendants. Let's keep it that way. Can I count on you? As hard as this is for me, I will remain as silent as the grave. No one will ever find out anything through me. But tell me, has the Grail ever been here? Who knows? Who knows? Doesn't the Grail rest in all our hearts? I need to say goodbye now, but maybe destiny will bring us together again. Miss Hamilton, Professor, farewell. It was an honor to work with you. It was a pleasure for me too. And maybe, well, I don't know how to express myself. Spit it out. Maybe one day you'll need an insistent, stubborn scientist for your research. That, I'm sure of, Professor. Maybe even soon, 